Scientists on trial for failing to accurately predict the future. This is not a scene from the Minority Report, which we saw earlier. This is actually real. Uh, right now in Italy, there's a trial where seismologists are being brought up on charges for essentially failing to alert the public about a pending earthquake that ultimately uh, and tragically caused um, several hundred lives. And these scientists weren't inept. They did their jobs well, they had access to resources, and they had everything that one would need to be a seismologist. And so what's interesting about this is that it, it, it touches upon their ability to uh, <clears throat> make judgment calls about what anomalies in their data sets to make available to the public and which ones not to make available to the public. And so this case is really interesting to me because it all hinges around the public's access to that information. Just to give you an idea of what they're looking at, this is the type of information they collect. They take historic information uh, and patterns and they look for trends and they compare it with the current situation, the current context of what's going on. And looking for anomalies in a data set like this, you're obviously bound to make mistakes. But th this case is really interesting because it all comes down to that, that access to pu the public's access to information that they didn't have and what precedent is being set, um, whichever way the case goes. And so for me, <clears throat> this makes me think of a quote made by a guy named Alistair Kroll, which says, data doesn't invade people's lives. It's the lack of access to control uh, of how it's used that does. Meaning, uh, you know, in this case, the lack of information is what uh, failed the public, essentially. Um, and so I'm very passionate about uh, uh, ways of making uh, information more available to the public so that they can make better decisions for themselves in combination with uh, those who have access to private data. This isn't the first time this has happened. When we uh, think about the economic uh, collapse a few years ago, it essentially revolved around the public's access to information. Uh, you know, advice on whether um, an investment might be a good idea, advice on whether a mortgage might be a good idea. Speaking of mortgages, this is a chart made by a guy named Dan Edstrom, who he wanted to track down who owned his mortgage. Um, <laughs> so, so he spent a year making this chart. He tracked down almost 100 organizations. Uh, he talked to them. He, he, he asked them questions. It's like, so you have this part. This guy's got this part. And he wanted to find out who ultimately owned his mortgage and talk to that person because he was having some issues. Um, <laughs> And what's interesting about this chart is, so number one, the whole chart didn't fit on the screen, so that's why it's cut off. Uh, but the other interesting thing is, after a year of research, after talking to 100 organizations and, and detailing notes and all this stuff, it ultimately led over here to the right of the screen, where you see it leads to a black hole. No one actually owns his mortgage. Many people own bits and pieces. No one actually uh, is responsible for, for his, his um, Mortgage, and there, so there was essentially no one that he could talk to. He had to talk to all of these people about all these different things. Um, so the access to the information about about this took him a year to collect, which is uh, is obviously somewhat distressing. So I mean, there's something about uh, where we are in society, as we heard earlier this morning, that I think is changing, that is allowing us to circumvent these bottlenecks of access to information. Uh, when you think about news, news used to come in uh, the form of a paper or, um, you know, of, or the, the nightly news or, or what have you. Um, some of the most popular news destinations in the world right now are websites where there aren't editors, there aren't um, you know, these sort of hierarchical organi organizational st uh, structures. Uh, there's um, a community, and the community finds the news, the community consumes the news, community shares thoughts with each other, and they edit and they curate what they ultimately consume. Uh, sites like Reddit, Dig, uh, Storyful that you see here. Now this isn't just limited to recreation and, and, and information. Um, this can be, this sort of crowdsourcing can be applied to actual 
uh, work that organizations do. In this case, this is the United Nations website for, um, for data. It's called uh, un.data.gov. Uh, and people come to this website uh, to uh, essentially leverage all the work, all the research, all the resources that the United Nations has and that has, they've chosen to make available to the public. So if you're an organization who wants to go uh, do work in uh, Congo or you want to go to Brazil and, and uh, you know, carry out all sorts of projects, you can come here and find out access to years and years of collected information and make use of it in your project. Um, essentially, they're crowdsourcing the projects that result from their data. Rather than funding these projects themselves, they just put the data out in the public and now we can make better decisions about how that data is used, and we can do far more things than they can do as, as, a, as a singular organization. This is really important because when the public has access to information, I believe amazing things happen. In 2008, uh, an organization that I worked with for uh, some time uh, called Ushahidi was launched. Um, this before I joined, it was uh, launched by a, a group of Kenyan activists who, at the height of election violence during the 2008 um, uh, elections there, they created this platform that allowed citizens to let their voice be heard using mobile phones, collect that information, and put it on interactive maps that allowed emergency responders, and, and others to help them in times of need. So the, the country was in chaos. It was very divided over political issues. Two sides were fighting. It was, it was very chaotic. Um, and people were in distress. And so this simple tool um, just allowed uh, users to take that information and put it on a map. So that was their technological innovation. But the real innovation of Ushahidi to me is that it's yet another way of circumventing a bottleneck of distributing information. So in this case, taking the public information, the public cries for help, the public annotations about what was going on around them, and using that to contextualize information for emergency responders just allowed this whole loop to close itself without any sort of top-down organization whatsoever. This tool has been used now all over the world during the devastating tsunami and earthquake in Japan, uh, during the most recent uh, stuff in North Africa and the Middle East, and even right here in the U.S. during the BP oil spill. Other examples of how this can be used, cities are now making uh, information about crime available to the public. It affects real estate, it affects the police department. This is Oakland, California, where they uh, track in real time reports of crime around the city. Anyone can go there and consume this data and make decisions using it. Another one from London. The Red Cross uses this media monitoring station where they take public information available through social media channels, and they sort of canvas the world based on what people are saying and what they're doing and what they're talking about, the photos they're sharing, and it just gives them a, a much greater sense of context when they're going to new areas. What's interesting about this, um, all of these technologies, is that they are only possible because the data set that they use is made available. It's the public information, taking what was once private, what's in the realm of private, and moving it into the realm of public domain, public access, and public usage. My own work, we specialize in uh, visualization, uh, which is essentially taking abstract concepts, big numbers, big data sets, and making them make sense to to anyone, regardless of a level of expertise. <clears throat> and obviously, when de dealing with some of the issues at this scale, that's really important. It's necessary, because not everyone shares the same level of, of, of training or expertise as the people uh, who traditionally do uh, this type of research. In this case, we worked with a team of researchers who were uh, studying the impact of Hurricane Irene, which affected the northeast seaboard of the United States last year. And what they were looking for was correlations between how service was delivered to the public, how you know, trees were moved out of yards, how water was um, restored, and how electricity was restored, and so on. They, they were comparing that type of information, which is the traditional way of doing this, 
with social media data because it was, it was new to them. It was the, the new information channel that they hadn't had access to before. And what we did with them is we collected this information, we analyzed it, and we sort of graded it by emotion. It's called sentiment analysis. The more red dots you see here, that, those were negative uh, mentions. Hey, there's a tree in my yard, get it out now. But on the other scale, the blue represented good, um, and it was like the positive reactions. And the reason why they wanted to do this is because they wanted to see, they, they, they actually created a time series of this. Um, this is just one slide, but if you look at them in succession, you see these colors change over time. And they wanted to see if the change over time matched the areas where service was delivered in that same time. So they were looking for gaps in delivery. They were able to form conclusions and, and ultimately, they're looking for ways of making dis these types of decisions in real time, which we can now do because we have so much information around us. And so when I think about projects like this and some of the other examples that I talked about and how it all ties back to the quote that I gave you at the beginning, for me, if, if it's the lack of access to information uh, and the lack of access to making use of data that is interrupting our lives, it's tools like this and technologies like this that just give us a little bit more control over how things affect us. Thank you very much.